2002. I'm sitting in a movie theater next to a girl I have a huge crush on. I'm 12 years old, but I got big plans. Tonight's the night. I'm going to make out with a girl for the first time. So here's how it goes. Step one, take girl to movie. Step two, put arm around girl. Step three, make out. <laughs> but I've been here for an hour and I'm still stuck on step two. I don't understand how you're supposed to put your arm around someone in these awkward theater seats. But I refuse to live in regret as the guy who chickened out on his big date. So I created diversion. I throw my giant flip phone on the ground by her feet. She leans forward to pick it up, and boom, I plant my arm in her chair <laughs> right before she leans back into it. Ooh, she says, this is kind of uncomfortable. I don't know what to do. I wiggle my arm a little higher so it's over her shoulders, but now it's just wedged into the back of her neck because these seats are too tall and straight. Maybe we should just hold hands. <sighs> but the armrest doesn't fold up, so I have to twist my arm around into her lap, and I'm pretending I don't notice how sweaty my hand is. <laughs> Finally, this movie ends and I release her. <laughs> she scurries off to find her friends, and I just sink into my chair, I'm mortified. I'm looking over at that chair next to me, where she just was, and I'm thinking, how is this so hard? What did I do wrong? <laughs> and in that moment, my career was born, because <laughs> I realized I was only a victim of negligent design. <laughs> it's true. And if this has happened to any of you, you're not alone. It's not your fault. <laughs> we think of design as aesthetics, as icing on the cake. But it affects our lives in so many more ways than we realize. Design surrounds us during every waking moment, and it determines how you interact with the world. I learned the full potential of this on Stanford Solar Decathlon. It's a national competition that challenges young engineers to design and build a sustainable home for the future. On the Stanford team, we took it as an opportunity to also redefine the daily touch points in a house, like a sink faucet or a light switch, things that haven't really changed in like half a century, and redesign them in a way that encourages a more sustainable lifestyle, like a switch that turns off everything in the room, not just the lights. There are three things that allow effective design to shape your experiences and influence your behavior in positive ways. I could tell you them, but I'd much rather show you. So I'm going to show you how these things work using the chair you're currently sitting in. First thing I want to do, though, is give your chair a name, because I'm going to be referring to him a lot. So from now on, your seat is Winston. Winston Churchill. <laughs> so take a moment and notice all the places where Winston's making contact with your body. Your arms, your shoulders, hips. Notice the different texture of his materials, the wood. Notice the firmness, temperature. Think back to when you first sat down. How long did it take you to find your seat? Has Winston made it easy for you to get up and go to the bathroom when you need to? Where'd you set down your coat, your bag? Are these things easy to reach and safe still? Has a single thought about this chair crossed your mind at all since you got here? <laughs> if the answer is no, Winston was very well designed. <laughs> it's called transparency, just like Cecilia was talking about. But it's not just Google Glass, it's with everything. It's when design meets all of your expectations, fulfills your needs without demanding your attention. The reason we make tools in the first place is to augment your physical and mental abilities. A great tool is one that feels like an extension of yourself. The best tools you don't even realize you're using. It's funny, designers try really hard to be unnoticed. Like this lamp. There are projectors and sensors hidden inside of it to create a digital photo album. So it responds to physically turning pages, just like the old-fashioned kind. So kids can send photos to their grandparents' bedside table, and they never have to use a computer. There's no learning curve, because all the technology is transparent. So just like that lamp, Winston Churchill here is also hiding something, but his secret is a much darker one. Winston is a silent killer. 
Study after study is showing the long-term health risk of sitting down all day. This one equates an extra three hours of sitting every day outside of work with a 36% higher mortality rate. That's worse than smoking. Little changes, often influenced by design, have a big impact over the course of your life. That's the idea behind the sink we designed for solar decathlon. Uh, the first prototype wasn't as pretty, um, but it, we installed it in my bathroom, and it works the same way. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> so you use your leg to control the water instead of your hand. And this way, there's, you never have a reason to leave the water running. It, you use exactly as much as you need every time, by default. My roommates and I have been using this for two months now, and our water bills have been 2% less than their usual average. That seems insignificant, I know, but so does three extra hours of sitting every day. These little changes add up, and over a lifetime, they have a big impact. Okay, Winston may be a silent killer, but nobody's perfect. In fact, if I asked you to describe for me the perfect chair, you would tell me, design me a chair that holds me in the most perfectly comfortable and ergonomic position and I would build it for you, and you would hate it. Because we're not static creatures. We move the position of our back and legs once every 60 seconds, and our arms, we change position every 20 seconds. It's not a bad thing. Fidgeting helps you circulate blood. It keeps you awake. What I'm saying is, we don't really know what we need. Because a chair that held you in one position, even if it was the perfect position, after an hour, you'd be miserable. We're not perfectly rational creatures, and good design doesn't expect us to be. It fulfills all of our human needs, even the irrational ones. Here's a great example. This is a heart defibrillator that's designed for public spaces. So if you collapse from sudden cardiac arrest, anybody can grab this thing and shock you back to life. Inside, there are two pads. The first pad, it tells you to put on their chest. Second pad, down by their ribs. But in reality, the pads are totally interchangeable. It would work either way. So why include this? Why give someone unnecessary information and false constraints when saving time is so critical? Because we don't always respond rationally, especially under stress. We think differently. Usually we want flexibility in products, but in this case, if we don't get explicit orders, we panic. And that's what wastes time. Here's a less extreme example of humanizing detail. This time it's audio. When you give Google Translate a really long run on sentence, it eventually runs out of air and stops to take a breath. How adorable is that? <laughs> so from an efficiency standpoint, there's no reason to do that. But it's humanizing. It makes it a little more pleasant to listen to. There's a word for a design like this that has personality in a way that makes it work better. And it's my favorite word. Butility. Where beauty meets utility and pleasure becomes functional. If you want to see a complete lack of butility in design, take a look at your arm. Because I notice Winston here also has a shared armrest. So who's using it right now? You or your neighbor? <laughs> or are you both avoiding it now? <laughs> it's not your fault. This has been a design flaw for decades, and you guys are victims. There's no way to decide who gets it. There's no social convention. You just wait until someone goes for it, and then it's over. <laughs> the silent battle of the armrest is what designers call a micro-interaction. It's a detail separate from the main functionality, that creates its own little moment by subtly engaging your emotions. Like a tiny chocolate mint on your pillow. <laughs> These things, micro-interactions, are really micro-mood swingers. Here's one you may not have noticed, but I bet you've experienced. When you log into a Mac, instead of, if you give it the wrong password, instead of scolding you with ugly red font like an intruder, it just does this little shake. And everyone on Earth knows what that means. It's like, nope, try again. <laughs> try again. 
It's universal. <laughs> you would never buy a computer, though, because it does this. It's hard to see the value in these little details on their own, because they're not features. They're not marketable. They're personality. Like this expression my brother makes when he's trying to hold back a smile. Or when my dog Alex wakes up because she farted in her sleep. <laughs> This is not why you hang out with Alex, but it is why you fall in love with her. Every interaction you have with a product or a person, like those products that you buy something because of, <laughs> you buy it for how it works, and then you love it for how it works. It's the details. Every interaction you have with a person or with a product. Has some level of emotional exchange. Psychologists call it the emotional economy, because every one of these exchanges throughout the day leaves a little dent in your emotional bank account. And these things affect your emotions and your decision making. Studies have shown that by putting things like smiley faces on your utility bill, you can decrease the average person's energy consumption by eight percent. But even when there's no greater goal like sustainability, just turning insignificant details into tiny sources of joy, I think that's a great way to change the world. I mean, what's the point of creating a sustainable future if it's just for a bunch of gloomy people with boring, ugly things? <laughs> people say technology is turning us into robots. I think it's the opposite. I think good design can create new humanism. I love this fact: a running man is ten times less energy efficient than a flying condor. But if you build the man a bicycle, he instantly becomes twice as efficient as the condor. In the 70s, Steve Jobs had a dream that computers could be like a bicycle for your mind. Isn't that a beautiful idea? Design is a lot more than the icing on the cake. I've given you three principles today. I don't expect you to walk out of here and go design a product with them. You could, it'd be awesome, but I'd rather you design a moment, because that's something that each of you already does every day. You affect your environment, and you change the experience that people have around you. You can aspire to be unnoticed and support your friends when they need you without needing thanks or recognition. You can embrace the irrational needs of the people you love, tiny weaknesses, because you shouldn't correct those things. They're what make them the people you love, and you can be the tiny mint on someone's pillow, the micro mood swinger that keeps them afloat on a hard day. Do that, and I think you're designing a life of beautility. Thank you. <laughs>